He had built the most opulent of kingdoms, Babylon, the golden city. But in the midst of his dominance and control, he lost all control because of one thing. He failed to learn that true glory is found only in submission to the will of God as revealed in his commandments. How tragically, folk, this is the same problem that plagues us as a people today. The Seventh-day Adventists. This is the great thing that plagues us today. We have hospitals, we have schools, we have churches, we have a conference set up and an organization that is better than any on this planet. But it will fail, as First Selected Messages 204 and 205 says. It will fail. Ellen White says, storm and tempest will sweep away the structure. It will be swept away, folks. Why? Because everything sinks into insignificance if we are not in submission to the will of God as revealed in His commandments. Amen. Any human being, apart from the grace of God, will lose everything when they become confident and self-sufficient. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 5 says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything is of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Mm -hmm. You know, it was real interesting a couple of weeks ago. And the folk meant well. Folk meant well. But they, they visited our church down there in Florida. And uh, during the, the sharing time, one, one man and his wife, they were visiting from upper state New York, and the man said, um, we just counted a privilege to be here today with Pastor Bill Hughes, you know. And I'm going, wait a minute. I think we should count it a privilege that the Lord has promised that he'll be here today. Amen. Amen. Because who is Bill Hughes? And then another guy was visiting from, I don't remember, Tennessee or Georgia or somewhere else. And he said the same thing, and I'm starting to get real uneasy, folk, because I'm nothing. I'm nobody. And if I think for one minute that I am somehow sufficient in myself, I'm dead in the water. I'm dead in the water. What did Nebuchadnezzar say? He said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? He thought he was somebody. He thought he was great. And Ellen White in 8 Testimonies 126 tells us to study Nebuchadnezzar's dream as recorded in the fourth chapter of Daniel. The king saw his prosperity and because of it was lifted up, notwithstanding the warnings God had given him. He did the very things which the Lord had told him not to do. He looked upon his kingdom with pride. And that was it. The jewel of the mind. The jewel of the mind. That which elevates man above the beast he no longer retained. The jewel of the mind, the ability to reason, the ability to discern from cause to effect, to discern right from wrong. Nebuchadnezzar lost it. He lost it. And he became a beast. He became a beast. The man thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceiveth himself. And that's Laodicea's whole problem. That's our problem. When we think we're something, when apart from God we're nothing, we're self-deceived. Self-deceived. And we begin way up here on a slope, thinking we're right at the very top, and all of a sudden we take this miserable... Of course, when you're up there and you're on a slide like that, that's fun. But folk... If we're talking spiritually speaking, we tumble down into oblivion. 
And the man we're going to look at tonight had that happen to him. Probably most of us are familiar with a year in Seventh-day Adventist history called 1888. How many of you have heard of that year in Seventh-day Adventist? Okay, so we're all pretty familiar with that. And the two men that are most famous for that year in Seventh-day Adventist history were Alonzo Trevier Jones and uh, Elliot J. Wagoner. Now this gentleman right here, Ellet, Ellet J. Wagoner, this was when he was a young man in the 1880s. He and A.T. Jones came from California. They ran the Signs of the Times. They were the um, co-editors of the publishing house there in Oakland, California. They ran the church in Healdsburg. And uh, they were turning the Seventh-day Adventist Church upside down. In fact, Uriah Smith and George Butler, as they approached the 1888 meeting in Minneapolis, Minnesota, they said, these two young upstarts, they're going to destroy the denomination if we don't watch it. Well, Ellen White saw it a little bit differently. But E.J. Wagoner was one of the two men that brought the message of righteousness by faith to the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1888. You know, a lot of people try to make this real confusing, but the Bible says real clearly that God's commandments are righteousness, and the only way that we can attain to obedience to God's commandments is by looking to Jesus Christ by faith. And that's all that message is. But from 1844 to 1888, other than Ellen and James White, the Seventh-day Adventist leaders, amongst whom would be Joseph Bates, D.M. Canwright, uh, Kellogg, um, J.N. Andrews, Uriah Smith, George Butler, they all taught that righteousness came by our own efforts. That's what they taught. If you go back and read Bates and Andrews and some of those other, Uriah Smith, they somehow left Christ out of this scenario. They left Jesus out. Well, Jones and Wagner put Christ right in the midst of the law of God. This was not a new message, but one the Adventists had not focused on for the first 40 years of their existence. In fact, in 1884, Ellen White said, we have preached the law for so long. Can you finish it? It has become as dry as the hills of Gilboa. That's right. That's right. E.J. Wagoner simply brought the message of Christ and his righteousness as the only means whereby anyone could keep the law of God. So Jones and Wagner brought the law and Jesus together. That's what they did. Ellen White, Testimonies to Ministers, pages 91 and 92. Listen to what she said. The Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness. Where does righteousness come from? From within? <laughs> That's a joke. The Bible says in Romans 8 that the carnal mind is enmity against God. So what can our carnal mind produce? It can only produce disobedience. It can only produce hatred against God's commandments. That's all we can produce, friends. 
we must turn to the righteousness that is found in Jesus Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, and his changeless love for the human family. Boy. So Ellen White, the prophet of God, the messenger of the King of Kings, said that God was leading E.J. Wagoner and A.T. Jones in the message that they brought in 1888. Wow. That's quite an endorsement, isn't it? And if somebody didn't watch it, if somebody wasn't careful, they could begin to think that any impression that hit their mind was also coming from couldn't they? Mm -hmm. They had to be constantly on guard. Constantly. Tragically, Wagoner and Jones both did not hold on. Mm -hmm. Tragically. We're going to look at Wagner tonight. We'll look at A.T. Jones tomorrow. Notice Ellen White on the 1888 message. It's taken from Special Testimonies to Ministers and Workers, Series A, 1897. She says, the whole gospel is comprised in learning of Christ. His meekness and loneliness. What is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. You know, we shy away from things that are painful, things that make us hurt, but you know why God allows those things? Because it forces us to see ourselves. We're forced to see ourselves. And we're forced to see weakness. And we don't want to see weakness. We don't want to see humility. We don't want to see meekness. Those are not words that we like to talk about let alone experience. But that is the very work of the third angel's message, and it is the very work of justification by faith. Laying our glory in the dust, and God doing for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. Well, you can imagine... Jones and Wagner, after the messages of 1888, they, along with Ellen White, started traveling around America preaching the message of righteousness by faith. They had, Jones and Wagner had the endorsement of heaven. Ellen White again said that the Lord was using these men in a mighty way. How do you think the brethren felt? How do you think Uriah Smith and George Butler and Dan Jones and R.M. Kilgore and all the other brethren at the General Conference felt about Jones and Wagner? They didn't like them. They weren't real fond of them. <laughs> well, so what happened? In the year 1892, Ellen White and many of her family were sent to Australia. And E.J. Wagoner was sent to England. And A.T. Jones stayed in America. You see, there's an old saying that says, if you divide something, what's it, what's it say? Conquer. Divide and conquer. Well, they could.
didn't beat them when they were united together. So you split them up, and maybe we can get them then. Mm. Ellen White seemed to have a premonition. She made this comment, letter 24, 1891. She said, it's quite possible that Elder Jones or Wagner may be overthrown by the temptations of the enemy. But if they should be, this would not prove that they had no message from God or that the work that they had done was all a mistake. I pray that these men upon whom God has laid the burden of a solemn work may be able to give the trumpet a certain sound and honor God at every step. That their path at every step may grow brighter and brighter until the close of time. Ellen White had a premonition. If she weren't a messenger of God, maybe somebody might even call that woman's intuition. But she seemed to feel that maybe Wagoner and Jones may be overcome. Mm -hmm. Wagoner continued when he went over to England. He worked for the Signs of the Times. He let out in the editorial work in London. He was stationed there until the General Conference session of 1903. Now when Elder E.J. Wagoner was sent to England, folk, he conducted Bible schools. He was the editor of the magazine that was being produced to spread all over England, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, any European country that spoke English. Wagoner was responsible for getting literature to those places. He preached, he was a writer, he was an editor. He did this, he did that, he did this, and he did that. Now what happens? What happens when somebody gets so busy doing God's work? What happens? What's that? Lose their connection. They lose their connection. You know what? If you go back and study the history of Saul, the first king of Israel, in the beginning Saul was a dedicated Christian man. Do you realize that? The Bible says that the Spirit came upon him and he prophesied. He was a Christian. But folks, Saul got too busy doing the work of the Lord in managing the kingdom of Israel. E.J. Wagoner got too busy too. And apparently, apparently there were a few problems in the Wagner home. I mean, let's face it. If E.J. Wagner is working so hard and pushing so hard, what do you think he felt like doing once he hit his front door and went inside? What do you think he felt like doing? And to go to sleep. That doesn't bode well for a relationship, does it? I would imagine that his wife, Jessie Mosier Wagoner, probably got a little bit frustrated with her husband from time to time. Do you think that's a fair rationale there? Well, Somebody else then entered into E.J. Wagoner's life. And E.J. Wagoner began to adopt a strange idea. While laboring in Great Britain, E.J. Wagoner began to espouse and promulgate views of spiritual affinity. 
Does anybody know what, don't look at the slide. Does anybody know what spiritual affinity is? What that is, is that one not rightfully a marriage partner here might be one in the life to come. And this allows a present spiritual union. This was what led to his downfall. In 1901, he came to the general conference session enthused with what he called Precious spiritual light. Ellen White was shown that instead the views he was then espousing were dangerous, misleading fables. Similar to the fanaticism she had been called to meet following 1844. Of this she wrote, Dr. Wagner was then departing from the faith in the doctrine he held regarding spiritual affinities. Now let's break it down real simple. There was an, a, a nurse in London. Her name was Edith Adams. And Edith Adams became a convert to the Seventh-day Adventist faith. She started working for E.J. Wagner as his secretary. I'm sure Edith Adams was very encouraging. I'm sure she was very supportive of E.J. Wagner. During this time of the 1890s, while in England, E.J. Wagner began to believe that the Spirit of God was telling him that Edith Adams was going to be his spiritual wife in heaven. And that they could have a spiritual union here, but in heaven they would actually be married. Now, let's, let's illustrate that for a minute, okay? Let, let's make it real simple. E.J. Wagoner in their, their home there in London, he comes bounding down the stairs one morning and Jesse has prepared him a bowl of oatmeal and it's nice and warm and he sits down to eat it and he says, Jesse, the Lord has shown me great spiritual light. <laughs> and Jesse says, well, E.J., what, what is that? What did the Lord show you? And E.J. Wagner says, Well, Jesse, there's such a thing the Lord has shown me. It's called spiritual affinities. Mm -hmm. Jesse said, Dear, that's getting a little bit deep. Make it practical. E.J. Wagner says, Well, Jesse, there could be another person outside of our relationship that you might feel very attracted to or that I might feel attracted to and we can't marry them in this life but in heaven we'll be married to them. Mm -hmm. Sister, Sister Bethay, how would you feel if Brother Ben came down to breakfast and told you that about some lady that he worked with? <laughs> that wouldn't be good. And, I, and, and number, and number one, I'll be your secretary. Okay. So we worry about nobody coming down with that. Uh huh. Uh huh. That's probably wise. <laughs> you would, number one, you'd be his secretary. But number two, if he came down after the fact and told you that, you'd probably give him a swift kick and he'd go right out the front door. That's not exactly. And I'll bet you Jesse Mosier Wagoner felt the same way. <coughs> Can you imagine? Mm -mm -mm. I read accounts of E.J. Wagoner during this time where he said the Spirit of God was telling him mm -hmm. that his spiritual bride was his secretary, mm -hmm. Edith Adams. Mm -hmm. Folk, let's be real clear. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit 
does not work contrary to the principles of God's law. Mm -hmm. Doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. That's right. The Holy Spirit impresses principles that are in harmony with God's law. E.J. Mm -hmm. e. Wagoner was not listening to the Holy Spirit. He was listening to a demon mm -hmm. spirit. That's, Mark, how we, that's how we test the spirits, is based on God's word. To the law yeah. and to the testimony. Wow. The to this, yeah. There's no light in them. That's exactly right. Yeah. But you see what happened. 1888 to 1891, Ellen White, the prophetess, is saying the Lord is using Jones and Wagner. They got it in their heads. Whatever we think, it's from God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And therein lies the danger. Mm -hmm. And the only thing, folk, the only thing that could have saved those men and can save us is that time on our knees, in prayer, in submission to the authority of Christ mm -hmm. in our lives on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. That is the only way to be saved from this insanity. In England, Wagner had become friendly with Edith Adams. After he returned from England, Edith Adams followed him to Battle Creek. Mm -hmm. Her recovery was rapid. Wagner soon arranged for her to have employment as a nurse at Battle Creek. This was in the 1904-1905 range now. Late, okay, in 1905, Mrs. Wagner divorced her husband on the ground of adultery. Do you think she had grounds for that? Yes, she did. Yes, she did. <laughs> I can't, I can't think of a, of a quicker and more effective way to destroy a marriage than for a husband to say, Dear, I have a spiritual bride, <laughs> and she's my secretary. Mm. The next year, Dr. Wagner and Miss Adams were married. Mm. This terminated his membership with the church for several years before the breakup of Wagner's marriage. He had been advocating spiritual affinity. Again, his view was that one not rightfully a marriage partner here might be one in the light to come, and that this allowed for a present spiritual union. Ellen White called these views dangerous, misleading fables. Mercy. She said that Wagner had been sowing the seeds of these satanic theories in England for a long time. Folk, E.J. Wagoner, 1888, turned Adventism upside down. And a few short years later, lost hold mm. on the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. Destroyed it. Wagner had been married to Jesse Mosier in the late 1870s, had two children from her. Actually, they had three. But one of the children died in childbirth. Mm. The two girls were Bessie and Pearl. Mm. After their move to England, Wagoner's secretary and former nurse Edith Adams came into the picture. Wagoner began to believe that the Holy Spirit told him that sometimes people do not marry their spiritual bride. So the bride they have on earth is not their real partner, but the spiritual bride is, and it's the spiritual bride with whom a person will live for eternity. Wagner was led to believe that Adams was the spiritual bride, and Ellen White made it clear it was not the Lord who showed this to him. Mm -hmm. Oh, E.J. Wagner had become a man adrift out in the midst of an ocean expanse, mm -hmm. and he didn't know where he was going. Mm -hmm. Didn't know where he was going. It's a different twist that reminds me of Mormonism. What's that? I said it's a different twist on it, but it reminds me of Mormonism and what they teach. You mean with having multiple? With multiple wives. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's there's a similarity. Mm -hmm. 
Ellen White, as you would only expect, wrote so many letters to try to pull this man back from the pit in which he was descending. October 2, 1903, she said, It's those who've had the most light that Satan seeks the most assiduously to ensnare. He knows that if he can deceive them, they can, under his control, close sin with the garments of righteousness and lead many astray. God grant that our teachers may see and understand this, their great danger that they may recover themselves from the snare of Satan and put forth redoubled efforts to save others who are exposed. Two days later she wrote, You have been represented to me as being in great peril. Can you imagine? Mm. 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 Ellen White says, I saw you. The Lord showed me you in vision. Mm. Satan is on your track. Well, let, let's just, let's just <coughs> let the rubber hit the road. How about it? <coughs> the devil is on your track. At times he has whispered to you pleasing fables, has shown you charming pictures of one whom he represents as a more suitable companion for you than the wife of your youth or mother of your children. Mm -hmm. Satan is working stealthily untiringly to affect your downfall through his spacious temptations. He is determined to become your teacher. You need now to place yourself where you can get strength to resist him. He hopes to lead you into the mazes of spiritualism. Mm -hmm. let's, let's be real clear, folks. Spiritualism is not just about somebody reading the lines in our hand. Mm -hmm. It's not just about looking into a crystal ball. When we begin to respond to our carnal nature and invite the impressions that it is making to us contrary to the law of God, we're holding communion with something that should be dead. That's our nature. Mm. And when we're holding communion with something that should be dead, that's spiritualism. That's spiritualism. Can you please repeat that? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> when we are listening to our carnal nature, mm. and we are heeding what it says, mm. we are becoming involved in spiritualism because we are listening to and responding to something that is supposed to be dead. Mm. That's our carnal nature. Mm. Every day, Paul says, I die daily. daily. Mm. Mm. E.J. Wagner, Ellen White said, you're in danger falling into spiritualism. <clears throat> he hopes to wean your affections from your wife to fix them upon another woman. He desires you shall allow your mind to dwell upon this woman until through unholy affection she becomes your God. Mm. The enemy of souls has gained much when he can lead the imagination of one of Jehovah's chosen watchmen to dwell upon the possibilities of association in the world to come with some woman whom he loves and they're raising up a family. Mm. You know, folk, I've read accounts of E.J. Wagoner's daughter, Pearl, who obviously loved her dad dearly. And I've heard and I've read accounts of Pearl Wagoner's husband write accounts about his father-in-law, E.J. Wagoner. The impression that you get is, is that E.J. Wagoner and A.T. Jones, during this time, were very godly men. Folk, they were under the control mm -hmm. of a demon spirit. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. 
I have been shown, Ellen White wrote, your peril during the time of your connecting with Dr. E.J. Wagner. You both came to the General Conference of 1901, enthused with what you supposed to be precious spiritual light. You were desirous of presenting this light to me, but I was shown that much of that which you supposed to be precious light was dangerous, misleading fables that I must have no conversation with you regarding these ideas that were filling your minds. You know, folk, we get this idea that anybody who comes along, any, anybody who thinks they have some new idea that, oh, we're supposed to listen to them because that means we're a good Christian person. That's not what Ellen White did. She said, these people are coming straight from hell, mm. and I'm not going to talk with them. Mm. Dr. Wagner was then departing from the faith and the doctrine he held regarding spiritual affinity. She wrote that in 1908. Mm. Many people felt that E.J. Wagner was a good guy because he stayed within the denomination. But folks, what difference does it make if somebody stays within an organization but they throw away the messages that make us the people we are? What difference does it make? By the time of his death in 1916, Wagoner had given up many of his distinctive Adventist beliefs. Mm. It's very clear that Wagoner had given up his understanding of the sanctuary in 1844. He clearly was in opposition to Ellen White. In 1906, Elder Wagner, after his wife had divorced him because of his attentions to a nurse, he married her. This, of course, terminated his connection with the church. A few years later, we find him at the Battle Creek Sanitarium, <coughs> working in medical and religious lines. So E.J. Wagoner, and we'll see tomorrow, A.T. Jones, right around this time period, 1905, 1906, 1907, they're working at the Battle Creek Sanitarium. You say, oh, but that's an Adventist institution. By that time, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Because you remember the pantheistic doctor, John Hardy Kellogg, mm -hmm. was teaching pantheism. Mm -hmm. And it was during this time when Ellen White wrote to the Adventist people and she said, stay away from Battle Creek. Have nothing to do with John Harvey Kellogg. E.J. Wagoner was right there. There's no record he ever openly opposed the Adventist church. He died 61 years of age, May 28, 1916. While he never spoke against the church, my summation was that E.J. Wagoner stepped away from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and to doctrines of demons. Wagoner began to believe that the Lord spoke directly to him, mm. and he took that to be above the scriptures. Mm. As Mark so adroitly said a few moments ago, it is the scriptures by which we judge everything that hits our brain. Everything. Wagoner flipped that and thought that the Lord was speaking to him and that was above the Bible. He committed adultery and felt that he was being spirit led. Mm. Folk, what do you call that? When you are so convinced that you're doing something right and it's completely wrong, 
What's that called? That's insane. That's insane. Jesus called it the unpardonable sin. Mm. Mm. Did you know that? Matthew chapter 12. The Jews said that the work that Jesus was doing was that of Beelzebub. They called the work of God the work of the devil. That was the unpardonable sin. E.J. Wagoner, in believing that committing adultery with Edith Adams, that he was being led by the Spirit, that's the unpardonable sin, folks. Finally, E.J. Wagoner eventually rejected the sanctuary. 1844, the judgment, and Ellen White. God has left this information for us that we might stay low to the ground, that we might realize our weakness and our absolute dependency upon Jesus each and every day. Let's pray. <laughs> Dear Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for this story tonight. Thank you for the mighty way in which you used this man. How sad that he let go. Father, how sad when one person lets go, but how much even more tragic when an entire denomination lets go. Mm and yet still believes it's following you. Father, I just pray that each one of us here this evening would use our power of choice to cling, to cling to your hand, because therein is our strength alone. In Jesus' name, amen.